Today's topic is the initiation of the nuclear explosion in the Nagasaki bomb. There are two steps. The first is the detonation of the chemical explosive that compresses the plutonium, and the second is the emission of enough neutrons at the center of the compressed plutonium to start the nuclear reaction. This diagram we saw last time shows the propagation of the detonation wave through the composition B explosive uh, right after the detonator. Now, the first question we have to ask is, since there are 32 detonators, how simultaneously must they all be ignited? Well, this diagram shows how far an 8,000 meters per second detonation wave will move versus time. And I think it's pretty clear that the simultaneity of the detonations must be in the 100 nanosecond range. That's one-tenth of a microsecond, one ten millionth of a second. The first efforts to detonate all these explosives simultaneously used primacord, shown in this picture. This is just a weatherproof plastic tube with a peton, pentaerythritol tetranitrate high explosive inside it. And this tube is manufactured as uniformly as possible so that the uh, speed of the detonation wave will be constant. So in the first tries, they used a, a single blasting cap to detonate 32 equal lengths of primacord, which were inserted into uh, each of those polygons on the surface of the bomb. It didn't work. It wasn't good enough. The uh, spherical compressing wave was not uniform, and it would not have led to a nuclear reaction. So, what was finally decided upon was to use a, an electric detonator, uh, a set of 32 electric detonators. Unfortunately, the electric detonators at the time uh, were, were not uniform enough. So, they invented a new type of electric detonator called an exploding bridge wire detonator. This is a diagram from some uh, advertising materials. You can see two wires coming in here with a, uh, a header made of plastic. And you can't actually see the bridge wire. It uh, spans between those two wires right at the beginning of the peton. And when the wire explodes, it sets the peton off, which in turn sets off the RDX and goes on to the rest of the body of the high explosive. Now, the, uh, the next trick was to get all of those exploding bridge wire detonators to go off at the same time. And for that, they used a modification of a circuit called a Marx generator. A Marx generator has a number of capacitors which are charged in parallel, and then some very fast switches called um, spark gaps, the first of which is a triggered spark gap, which instantaneously changes all those capacitors from parallel to series, which has uh, a very high voltage. And since the capacitors are extremely low impedance capacitors, they can also supply a very high current for the short time it takes to vaporize those bridge wires and start the explosions going. It's also necessary for every one of the wires from the detonating unit to a... Uh, detonator to be exactly the same length because they only have to be different by this length to have a one nanosecond difference in the time that the detonator will explode. 
Now, after all these explosions have happened and the plutonium has been compressed, we come to the necessity of releasing a bunch of neutrons at the right time. The way this was done in the Nagasaki bomb and the Trinity device was by using this nuclear reaction. Helium nuclei, which are alpha particles, were emitted by a, uh, an isotope called polonium-210. And th when these helium nuclei, or alpha particles, struck beryllium-9, they created carbon-12 and an extra neutron and a gamma ray. And it was these neutrons which were used to start the nuclear explosion. This picture shows the physical arrangement of these materials. Basically, this device was called an urchin. The pictures of the urchin have never been declassified to this day. This picture was drawn by Alex Wellerstein for his excellent nuclear secrecy blog based on verbal descriptions of the urchins. The entire structure is made of beryllium, including the outer shell and the inner sphere. The inner sphere is suspended on some pins, uh, which is the re reason for the name urchin for this whole thing. The beryllium parts of this were plated with either nickel or gold or both, and then on top of that was plated the polonium, so that the polonium is isolated from the beryllium until the whole thing is squashed by the implosion of the plutonium sphere. This thing is only an inch across and it right, sits right in the center of the plutonium sphere. When it's squashed, all those ridges you see are there to ensure a uh, quick and complete mixing of the polonium with the beryllium and the resulting release of uh, quite a bit of neutron radiation to start the nuclear reaction. Now, in more modern bombs, we see instead a device like this. This one is from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And it shows a titanium target, which has some deuterium and or tritium uh, reacted with the titanium to form titanium hydride or deuteride, and a plasma generator, which also has deuterium or tritium, and a high voltage accelerator. So basically, in this kind of device, and, and you can see from the scale that the thing is less than a centimeter across and just a few centimeters long. This thing can generate sufficient neutrons to set off a nuclear weapon. And it doesn't have to be in the center. It can be on the outside and beam the neutrons in to the center where they're needed to set off the reaction. Now, the main reason why this kind of device is used today instead of the urchin is that the polonium-210 in the urchin has a half-life of only 138 days. So it was necessary every uh, couple of years to disassemble the Nagasaki-type bombs, remove the urchin, and put in a fresh one. Uh, the whole point of keeping uh, an arsenal of nuclear weapons is kind of defeated if you have to take them apart every couple of years and renew some of the parts.